one of so one of the big themes in what we do is translating what has happened to Linux already. So Linux, I don't know if you know the figures behind it, but I mean Linux really runs pretty much the the core of the internet. Like if you talk about servers, I think it's about 99% of all servers that run Linux in one way or another. Um, as far as uh, Cell phones, it's about, I believe the number there is about 80%, so Android is pretty much taken over. So throughout, this is well accepted that Linux works as a way, so in other words, open source software works. So when I went to this conference, what blew me away actually was the idea that all the people like from Microsoft, they were there, there's people from Apple and Google, and they were all talking about collaborating on open source projects like this artificial intelligence, computer vision, and all of that. I was like, wow, because if you look back, you know, like a decade or so, Microsoft would call Linux a parasite off, the, off people's hard work. You know, so, so we've seen it in, in software, and the idea is, well, what, what can happen in hardware using the same kind of techniques? And it's a totally different game, and we learned a lot of insights of, of how that works, the work that we started doing here. So we moved on to this parcel of land in 2006. Uh, it was totally raw, it was a, a soybean field, nothing on it. Uh, I came out here right after finishing my uh, PhD program in Madison, Wisconsin, and that was, uh, as soon as that finished, I was like, okay, no more of this, this is nonsense, getting farther and farther into a abstraction. Like, for example, when I went to a professor one time to ask a question about some waves, you know, we were studying waves and plasma physics. So I asked, okay, well, where does this exist? Can you show me an example? And the guy says, well, it doesn't exist, I just made it up. So it's like, okay, what are we doing in school when the problems that we're dealing with are not even real? It's, it's a real disconnect for me because I thought, you know, do something good with science, uh, make a better world, but the farther I went, the less useful I felt towards making an impact. And so I started out this idea when you were in school? Yeah, in 2004, uh, pretty much my last year at the PhD level, I thought, man, what if we really, really collaborated? Because even in my own group, I could not share openly the work that I was doing because we had some hot stuff. We had, I mean, we had some advanced research, published some good papers on it, but I could not talk openly to other groups. So I was questioning that. It's like, okay, what's going on here? Even in academia, you cannot talk openly about what you do. I mean, what kind of world are we living in? So that was a real disconnect for me. And I thought, okay, what is it simply if we just collaborate? I mean, it's a very simple thing. We learned that in kindergarten, maybe, you know, maybe in high school we might have thought like that. But as soon as you get into college, pretty much, everything turns pretty proprietary. Um, people are talking about, you know, you start talking about getting a job and then work for somebody and they're, they're typically a proprietary company. So that's, that's uh, the status quo. And lately I, I kind of coined this idea of academic open source. Like even our greatest, most amazing collaborators, the guys who did the Recyclobot filament maker. Uh, so that's Joshua Pierce at Michigan Tech University. The way things work, they cannot even talk to you about that until they publish a paper. Because if... They told me something about it, and I said I posted on a wiki or something. The way it works, when they go through review, they do prior art search, and if they find anything about it, they can't publish the paper. So effectively, by structure, by structural design, you cannot really collaborate in academia at all. So it's, it's really weird, and kind of hit me when I, I was just out there like last month. And yes, it's awesome when we have the final blueprints of the machine, but what about you know, those other 364 days where you're not collaborating, you're just kind of like waiting on it, on the result. I was kind of like, hey guys, when are you going to publish that? It's, I mean, it's great stuff because they have a pretty good one. And it turned out it worked, but it wasn't that great. And I'm thinking, okay, well, if we were to talk before I showed up there, we would have had a better result, very clear. So it's not just the fact that you can publish and be open source. Don't be academic open source, meaning publish throughout the whole process of development because that is the bulk of the time that happens. So that's just you know, one more item about the, the academic world. Okay, but that's my background. That's, um, that's Poland, the, the city of Poznań. That's my hometown, tax rolling down the street in 1982. That's not a parade, this is real stuff. Life behind the Iron Curtain, things were great. Material deprivation, I mean, rationed, certain things were rationed. 
Um, I mean, just basically, Russia was pretty much sucking 50% of our product and <laughs> going home with it. But um, that's around the 80s, the wall fell down. That's the time I came to America in 1982. Things got way better. This is sunny Madison, Wisconsin. That's the place where I got radicalized. So um, you can say uh, Madison is a very progressive place. Uh, so I, I really got into the somewhat of the activism scene, but more in uh, the collaborative kind of development. Because, for example, in my department, I could not, I mean, I had no contact with anyone else in other departments. I was like, okay, let's learn some other stuff to have a better rounded education. And there's absolutely no contact. You're in your research group. You don't really meet anybody else. So I started organizing things like what was called the Global Connections Forum um, for, for graduate students. So we had these interdepartmental socials. I got into stuff like, it was actually called Gandhi Network, where we started to do little workshop builds, like of a food dehydrator or a bicycle power system. So yeah, I started getting involved, and then that culminated in the last year with the open source ecology formulation of that. Someone showed me at one point Linux, like I saw it for the first time, I was like, wow, what's that? That must be hard. <laughs> and now we use Linux every day. But that's what I was dealing with, uh, discovering that I was useless with stuff like that. So we moved out here, middle of nowhere. This is the place, came down with, uh, with a, a Suburban, 200 chickens, and a tractor. <laughs> and that's it, we started to go at it. And it was a hard life. But yeah, we started doing stuff. Uh, at present, we're about 33% done. So there's 50 technologies in the Global Village construction set. And if you look at it, the, the ones that are done, call it the 3D printer. What's done mean? Done means that the blueprints and design is fully tested and it works. Uh, and it's pretty much ready for replica replication around the world um, at the level at least that we have it. So we call the 3D printer done, the micro house, so we can probably see Katarina's uh, seed eco home. That's a product that's absolutely fully documented. You can build an exact replica and it works. CB press, that we call pretty much done. The blueprints are all fully out there. The software is out there for automatic control of this brick press. It's all there. Power cube, which is the power unit. Micro tractor is pretty close. You can see it in the workshop there and so forth. CNC circuit mill, oh, you know, that, that could possibly be a little higher because that is a working device that, you know, we've got like 10 micron accuracy for the little milling on the circuit mill. So I think that should actually go to perhaps 100. Um, but about 33% done if you look at all, all that we've done. Well, plenty of work left. Um, by all means. So what are the major milestones we've achieved? So first of all, we found out if you just publish online, people can take, download your blueprints and, and make things themselves. So this is the first ever replication in Texas in 2011 where a guy took our blueprints, downloaded them, built this. And when he first showed it to me, I thought, hey, it looks like a Photoshop copy of my machine, but it's not, it's the real thing. Uh, that was built by James Slade. Um, so replications, other replications, like the tractor by a group of high school students in California, brick press that went to Africa. This is an interesting one. That, that's in Nicaragua, which looks like a brick pressing operation. There's all the bricks there. And that's two of our machines. And looks like, I'm seeing like four power cubes there. So it looks like some serious operation. We didn't even know about it. So things can get replicated by themselves. Um, that's an example of a house. So someone sent this to me a few years ago. And I wish I could follow up more about that, but haven't. Um, and recently, actually, so last week on a brick press, there's a guy in France right now who's pressing like 20,000 bricks right now as we speak. He's got a fully automated machine. Um, that's another one. So that kind of stuff happens here and there like once a year, but that's far from viral. I mean, this is not spreading. I thought when I first published the plans, I'd be like, wow, this is going to go all over the place. And I actually had to question myself about the, where I am in the game as in, okay, this is... I could make millions with this thing. Can I publish it? No, of course I said, okay, uh, you got to publish it. This is what's the priority here. It's for the good of the world so that everybody benefits so we get beyond the system that we have today. It's, it's more than myself. So that's it. Um, yeah, and that's, and that's actually a thing that uh, I've observed with a lot of people. A lot of people, you know, our hippie friends are like, oh, yeah, you know, we're going to be open source. You, you see a lot of times that once somebody publishes something that's actually working, they close it up. It happens a lot, and it's a, it's a big cultural issue, um, big big problem for this. But uh, open source in practice doesn't really exist in terms of hardware. 
So the second major milestone is the one day build idea, the fact that we're getting this, these swarm builds of like a dozen people or so to build machines in a single day. And why? I mean, you have to be efficient. We are actually competing with mainstream industrial production and we think we can do it better by a combination of digital fabrication. So we have these amazing autonomous tools like 3D printers or CNC torch tables or CNC mills that can do the work for you that before uh, it would take huge skill or huge capital to make it happen. Now we have access to that. We're also riding on the coattails of the emergent uh, experience economy. I think more people um, like to include a more in-depth experience, not just be plain consumers, but be more involved in what people do. Um, you have to be able to offer something that really works I mean, something that's simply efficient, and we, you know, we found that out here. Like, for example, the first ever structure that we built was the was the earth bag structure. It took about four weeks full time with two people for like it was like 200 square feet, very tiny thing, back breaking labor. And that's when I thought, okay, we need some power behind this. We need a CEB press because the CEB press actually works well for both industrial and natural building. So. That's, uh, that's why we started with the brick press as the very first thing that we built. We needed housing, so everything we do here, we bootstrap, try to bootstrap as we go along. Uh, and how do you do the one day build? You, you have to get documentation to be pretty good, like we call this IKEA style fabrication diagrams. So like IKEA diagrams, make it really simple, labeled, visually so you can comprehend it and so forth. And that was the team that built it first, um, built the first machine back there. So the machine itself, it weighs about a ton, like 1,600 pounds or so, fully automated. It makes about 5,000 bricks in a single day, which is enough for a small house. The material costs are about $5,000. And we sell them, if we do a workshop and build, we sell them for like 10,000 or so. So there's a revenue model there. So radical modularity is another big aspect that we do. So that is common interchangeable parts, like the tubing we use all over the place. We use the modular power units, like for example, the power, the, actually the drive unit on the tractor can interchange. So the modular power unit can be used to power your tractor, your, your fab equipment, like, like the iron worker machine to shear steel, uh, anything that's, that's got an engine in it that, that needs power. Like for example, we could even do the grinder, the plastic grinder, um, using a small hydraulic motor because they're very, very fat, very, very strong. And uh, it's a great option to do high torque, high power stuff, so that's the hydraulic power unit. But it could also be electric powered. You can run this off solar. Like for example, the tractor that we have down there, instead of using a, a gasoline engine, you can have a solar electric engine, electric motor. And the way hydraulics work, if you have less power, they just go slower, but they still have the same force. So you can, for example, put a single solar panel on our micro tractor and have it go very, very slowly such as pulling a chicken tractor on the field or something autonomously, if you add <laughs> autonomy to it. Um, so using a single solar panel, which is amazing. So you can do a lot of very slow, high power tasks in a uh, like a appropriate energy scenario just from solar energy, which doesn't fit with the modern industrial system because you just get in there with like 400 or 800 horsepower of the big tractor, do it in a day. But you can also design your agriculture to be much more uh, solar friendly and earth friendly as well by using the modern technology that's available. So if you have autonomous machines out there, say out in our orchard there, that we have a lot of different trees there. Uh, we can have chickens drawn by these kinds of chicken tractors that are tractor powered, solar powered. You can do all kinds of stuff. Or a very slow grinder, a solar grinder. You have a small hydraulic motor. And like a small hydraulic motor like this, it's like 40 horsepower. The power in there is amazing. But you can run, for example, the grinder on solar, so it spins very, very slowly. But if you just throw a bunch of stuff in the hopper, you just walk away, you, you do your stuff, and the thing works for you in the daytime in over six hours. So that's a great way to incorporate solar design with appropriate technology. So once again, modularity, we build things like torch table frames, this iron worker machine, which is a machine to shear slabs of steel. This can cut one inch slabs of steel that are like eight inches wide. Um, the universal rotors, which are used, for example, in this big trencher. The identical thing is used in the wheels there. Or it's used in a rototiller for mixing soil for the CEB press. 
this kind of modular design allows you to reduce your prototyping cycle greatly from months to days. So this is a great example. This is another ironworker machine that we built that also. We got that CNC cut, outsourced it. There was some milling work to be done. It's all nice and, nice and slick. But it took us like six months with one person doing like pretty much most of the time, six months to do that. So that's like impossible. That's not, if, if we do that, I mean, we're not going to be able to compete in terms of if you want to sell this as a real product, it can't take you six months. So we, we said, okay, let's simplify this. What's the absolute simplest design? We came up with that, and that thing is still sheared 1 by 10 steel. Before we broke it, shearing 1 by 12 steel, we took it all the way to destructive testing. But this thing could keep this nice, tight band get, blade gap between the two hardened steel blades. There's a big 5-inch cylinder that pulls it with like, I don't know, like 80 tons or 100 tons of force at that cutting blade. So you can Where shear steel like butter. Uh, sorry, question? Where did it break? Uh, you can see it kind of like bowed out. It, that machine is still in the workshop. You can examine it for yourself, <laughs> the straightness of it. But that's sitting in the corner still right now. Or this backhoe that we designed and built in a period of a week. So we talk about construction sets, which definitely applies to mechanical things. But why not other things, like CNC machines, like a whole construction set of CNC machines, which is exactly what we're doing with the universal axis or power electronics, electronics construction sets. Like for example, Shane, who's a collaborator with the, it's called Open Circuit Institute. He put together a part library of common parts that you can use to make a lot of things. And we can think about this as a pattern language of technology, just like Christopher Alexander came up with the pattern language for architecture. You can talk about what are the main most important little parts that make up everything. And it, if you go down to the basic building blocks, like elements in chemistry, like elements, there's a hundred or so of them, they make millions of compounds, right? Well, what about for our technology? Why can't we do the same? And that's exactly what we're doing. We're saying, okay, let's, let's talk about here's a, a rotor, so a thing that spins. Here's a thing that moves back and forth. <laughs> here's a... Um, you know, just define a small set of parts that are critical used everywhere. So that would be like a, a motor, you know, linear actuator of some sort, um, small set of parts. But the point being that if you understand how these things work, if we can uncover the veil of how, uh, kind of like the, the construction patterns of technology, then people can get, well, people can, can get much more involved in technology so that we get to the realm of appropriate technology that we actually control as opposed to technology controlling our lives, which happens today. So talk about modern, appropriate, open source technology. One thing we also achieved is real-time documentation. So uh, frequently what we've done, we do it sometimes. Uh, we haven't worked this out to the point where we do it every time, but we can have people on the internet through Google Docs. We take pictures. We upload them to the internet so that at the same time that we do a build, we can also have an instructional come up by a remote collaboration team, which is important because a lot of times you just don't get to record what you build. Documentation is a big issue. So we'd like to make that a stable process. So yeah, we're, we're working on a revenue model, which we think we figured out. So the extreme manufacturing workshop, you get a bunch of people together to do things like build this house that's actually the my place right here, it's a micro house that's only like 150 square feet. We're building that with our tractors and our brick press. Uh, that was the first one we built with the brick, brick press and power cube in the back there. Uh, that's wood clad because the bricks are not stabilized. Uh, you can also add cement to stabilize them so they're waterproof, but if you don't waterproof them, you have to use some kind of a cover so they don't melt in the rain. Now this is the CD home that was built two years ago now. That, that was built with 50 people in five days for the main structure of 1,400 square feet. And then the greenhouse, the aquaponic greenhouse back there, we also built another five days with 50 people as well. So that's the kind of extreme manufacturing deal that we're talking about. And we can go bigger than that. There's actually uh, people that do do this like this. There's a church group, who, it's called the Church in a Day. They actually get 200 people and they work 24 seven for one day and they get a whole church built in, in a, single day so 
Uh, and then other people like the Amish do it in their barn raising in a little different style. Mm -hmm. So this is the inside of the aquaponic greenhouse with uh, bok choy um, ready for some kimchi there. That's the aquaponic greenhouse. So you got these aquaponic towers. And this is the kind of stuff, for example, we can print with a 3D printer. That would be a great task. It's a complex geometry. It's got these holes there. We ream them out by slitting the PVC and then reaming it out with a bottle after heating it with a heat gun. Uh, that's something you can print that lends itself well to printing, complex geometries. So you could do that. And so here's our pond with the hydronic heating in there. There's like all these hazelnuts that we planted out in the fields there. But that's how it looked when it was taken care of. Right now it's a mess right in, right in there. But we've got big fish in there. We should catch some for dinner. Mm -hmm. We've got like a couple of hundred fish in there. So wow. uh, we should probably go hunting. So. <laughs> So this is the printer that we, we do the workshops. We build like a, like a dozen of them in a day. So this time today might make history if we build 18 of them in a single day. So it's a good day, the biggest one yet. We have never built 18. The most was about 12. Um, this is it, hot off the press. That's the latest version from our latest photo shoot. That's version 18.08. First time showing public. <laughs> So I know my personal experience about this was that it feels extremely empowering to see that you can build things. Like when I first built the tractor, it's a great empowering experience. You find out that it's not as hard as it seems if you, if you really want it, if you're interested in it. It's, it's not super hard to learn. That's the latest iteration of the tractor, which is uh, sitting in uh, that's the micro track with the fully metal tracks. What we could do here, if you talk about 3D printing, we could print rubber tracks, because you can print in rubber. So one of the real applications is printing tires. So say you've got like a, for a tractor, you have a, maybe like a metal wheel and then you just print, print the rubber that goes around it. They already do have these, these rubber tires where they kind of like collapse. They're not, they're not air filled. They kind of collapse because they got these ribs all over the place and they kind of squeeze down if you, if you hit a bump. So that's something we can totally do with 3D printing. And that means we of course would have to have a bigger machine and faster printing and that's where the scalability comes in. Uh, using the universal access system. Okay, but back to the theory here. Open source hardware does not exist. I mean, it's right there. It's like the fraction is very small. It's about maybe like a hundred million altogether in the open source products that are sold right now. Hundred million dollars per year. Um, about four percent is in open source software economy. It's about two trillion. So, for practical purposes, we don't really have it. So Linux won the battle, but it, I say it kind of lost the war in the sense that uh, at, at this point we still have not achieved much in terms of distribution of wealth to the to people in general, though there might be hints that it may be get, getting better, but let's see this. So I'd like to point to this one. Uh, 85 of the world's richest people own as much wealth as 3.5 billion at the bottom of the pyramid. This was about three years ago. This is insane, but that's the reality. And in fact, with the, with the current internet economy, that's gotten actually way worse. Look at this graph right here. Uh, that's about 80. That was in 2014. Six, 62 in 2016. 8 in 2017. That's the latest figures I got. Eight of the world's richest people own as much wealth as the 50% at the bottom of the pyramid. So it's not getting better. The number of billionaires, like this is 2000 to 2017, you had about 1,000 billionaires. Now we've got 7,000 billionaires on the planet. When is Elon Musk going to fix the problem? <laughs> no, not. I don't want to hear anything about Elon Musk. No, no, he's not. He's part of the, the, the game which is still not, it's not a distributive game that they play, right? He's a illegal joke. <laughs> yeah, but it's a, it's a serious answer. Because a lot of those people claim that they're saving the world. Like, uh, for example, I mean, I like, I like to listen to, for example, like the singularity people, like Peter Diamandis. They talk about all this exponential technology. But there's a thing that's missing in there for me, which is, which is about really the distributive issue. They're, they're basically in a camp. It's like, let's, let's make billions by helping a billion people, and then we can do good work for the world. For us, it's let's bring everybody up so we don't leave anybody behind, so we don't have to you know, do good work. Everything is good work to begin with. So it's a different kind of a mindset, and it's definitely sorely missing. I, I would say that uh, from the, the Silicon Valley crowd, 
I would say it doesn't really acknowledge the environmental issues about connecting back to nature and the resources that feed us, like silica and the, these computers. They come from nature. They come from sand and, and natural resources that, that are all around us. Um, and you can't keep on destroying the earth like here. You know, on our land, for example, we've got like between an inch to about five inches of topsoil here. When we started here in the prairie time, prairie land, it was like six feet of topsoil. Mm -hmm. So this gets basically all stripped. The figure for right now is four tons of soil erosion per acre per year is the average for plowed agricultural land. How can that be sustained? It can't. You have to keep pumping stuff back into the soil in terms of artificial fertilizers and chemicals because the biology is completely gone. If you have healthy soil, you've got the soil food web, you're generating, you're absorbing the nitrogen from the, the air, you're feeding the plants, the microbes in there. You know, like for example, fungus. If you got fungus in, um, on a piece of land, the, the mycelium, they breathe like we do. They're in the same family or something like that. But, they, but for example, fungus produces C, uh, CO2 and H2O water. So if you have a dry land, the the fungus that's actually in the ground provides moisture, so it actually comes from underground as well by decay of, of organic matter, so things like that. We need like plants with perennial polyculture that have deep roots so that you can draw water to above because rain just not, water doesn't just come from above, but it's also drawn from below. We can't keep destroying our farmland like that, like, like happens right now. Uh, for us, it's, we talk about, okay, what's the regenerative way to do it? We talk about perennial polycultures. We're getting involved, for example, in breeding of hazelnuts and chestnuts here, which are perennial crop alternatives to corn and soybeans. So that's a that's a good good work that can be done. And with fruits in general, um, a lot of times the industry tends to keep things short term, like thinking short term. So people don't think about plants that are really resilient, healthy by themselves that don't need fertilizers and chemicals. When people do plant breeding, they say, oh, we got this hybrid, okay, we can quit there, it's awesome, and they'll clone it. But what you should be doing is continue the breeding by sexual propagation so that things are fertilizing, and therefore continuously changing, and you can carry on that process. It's much more hard, it takes more time to develop something that is super resilient, totally natural, like it doesn't need pesticides or chemicals of any sort. But that's not what's done. So for example, if you get a peach from the store, that thing is sprayed. Why? Because it can't defend itself in nature. Because we're not allowing it to defend itself in nature because we're just putting dead end stops to evolution by cloning. So this is one of those big picture things on agriculture, on OSC's position on it, is that we can uh, do the perennial breeding for the long term like we're doing with the hazelnuts to obtain things that come true from seed and have all the desirable properties that the modern industry tries to but fails to get. And so, once again, if you think for the 500 years, of course you can do it. But if you're thinking for 10 years or 5 years or next year, you're not going to do that. And that's just what does not happen. So, like, all that food in a store can be organic and spray-free and all that, but it's not because that's not what we're designing as a society. So it's part of this bigger system that we're in. And uh, this kind of so back to distributive enterprise here. Look at this thing, though. So this is actually the Gini coefficient. So do you know what the Gini coefficient is here? That's a distribution of wealth from zero to one, where um, one is where one single person has all the wealth of the world. Zero is when the wealth is distributed equally across everybody. So where are we at on this? Historically, we've, we've been at about 0.4 in the 1800s. It's going up. Up means it's concentration of wealth till about 1988. And then there's a new data set I found. But it looks like actually it's going down. Going down, but I mean not to super impressive levels. I mean, maybe it does keep going down, and that's called the distributive economy. Maybe this is, this is where open source comes in. That means everyone gets access to, to resources. So a lot of people say that, um, OK, we can deal with that. We can have an unequal world. We, we can redistribute it. But of course, the better route is to say, well, let's not create the inequality in the first place. Let's try to bring everybody up. Um, let's not accept it as a fact of life that people are unequal. I mean, of course, we are unequal. 
but that's but being unequal in terms of our abilities and everything does not mean that we then take advantage of the weaker. It means that we should bring everybody up, and that would be the better way. Uh, but that's not, pra I wouldn't say that's practiced in general. There's an interesting feature here that that's worth looking at, because that's essentially the start of the internet. So is the internet helping, or is it going to go kind of like, you know, all the singularity guys are going to become superhumans and everyone's going to get left behind? Well, it's all up to us. It's a choice that we have all the time. So. Let's see what happens. We're, you know, we're doing our thing on on uh, open hardware to make it happen. So, what is the open source economy? Um, when we talk about, you know, what are we after? It's simply that we collaborate. In a single word, it's collaborative development. So that means all the economy is turned upside down because everyone right now gets patents. Your your competitive advantage is by keeping others out. That's how things happen right now. Uh, and we say that the hardware part is crucial. A lot of people forget, like in a software economy, that the software economy is still operating upon a physical reality that's underneath that, which is much bigger. It tends to get, get hidden from view because it's almost as if we gave up on it. You know, your big machines and your slave workers are going to take care of that for us, which happens. I mean, definitely the machines. Uh, are very powerful and, and they're very productive, uh, but we can do better on, on uh, not abusing people in the process. But hardware is is and will be. I mean, we, we don't unless we're breatharians. And we're we're going to need a lot of hardware. We're going to need home, homes and energy and stuff like that. So we cannot deny that hardware is very important, and the numbers show it. The the software economy is like two trillion. The hardware economy is about twenty trillion. Um, then the rest is the service sector and so forth. So these are some of the, the numbers there. There is about 10 times more impact in the hardware field than in the, in the software field. So, and a lot of the different ills of society are still around part, I mean, hardware or material aspects. I mean, we still haven't solved that issue of material security as a civilization, right? So that's war, poverty, corruption, government. It's, it's all about resources. It starts with physical resources. Uh, so the his I want to point to this because we want if we're going to say okay we're going to take over the world with open source is that possible? What would that look like? What's the tipping point for that? To to answer that question we're looking at let's look at the three sectors of society right now. The three sector theory says we've got the mining which is the, raw resource extraction, then there's manufacturing and service industries, they're about 10, 20, 70 percent. We work primarily on the mining and manufacturing aspect. Of course that leads into services, like the service we're providing here. But uh, le let's say that mining and manufacturing, the primary sec and secondary sectors are say 30 percent of the economy. We want to do this, we want to end poverty, <coughs> war and corruption solve the distribution issue, evolve as humans. Um, so we say that it's better to uh, distribute existing technology, as I mentioned, than to concentrate on the new technology. So it's kind of a play on words, because if you concentrate on new technology, obviously you're also concentrating more wealth, because a lot of the new technology is being proprietary. Most of it is. So here's the claim of what it would take of expanding the open source slice from this 0.001%, like one thousandth of one percent, very small. This is the claim of if we get to 1.3% of the economy, the open source hardware can have a meaningful chance of existing and being completely visible at a tipping point. So how do I come up with that number? Uh, it's an interesting number to keep in mind, because one trillion, that's, it's kind of manageable. We can do it. We take tipping point theory, which says that if you if 10% of the people are doing it, everyone's doing it. So that's that's the tipping point. We take 30% of the world's economy, which is hardware, primary, secondary sectors, and we talk about salaries, which are 40% of GDP. So we multiply those numbers together times the economy, we get 1.3 trillion. No, about 1 trillion, 940 billion. Oh, one yeah, 1.3%. 1 1.3% of the economy is about your trillion dollar value. So it's like if you want to have a rough number for what it takes, 
this is what the tipping point would look like in numbers. So we're working on distributed enterprise, published the concept first in the MIT Innovations Journal. This was like in 2011 or 12. Uh, that's when the word distributed enterprise comes up, came out. Uh, I don't think anybody knows what that means. It's certainly not part of our lexicon Wall Street. So, but how do we get there? So uh, we do modular design, just like borrowing from Linux. They, they succeeded because they could break down tasks into very modular architecture within Linux and have the supporting software tools to do it. We do the same. We, we try to do an analogous process, which means that, first of all, we take the economy. So we say, okay, let's, let's get a manageable set of 50 machines, which are very powerful, very, very resilient, robust, multi-purpose. We then break each of those into their individual modules. Like for the 3D printer, you're gonna have the frame, you're gonna have the axes, you're gonna have the extruder, the heated bed. So you can then work on those individual modules at the same time, as long as you define the interface between them. How do they fit together? So if you define the interface, you can spawn a massive parallel process on all those modules. But each of the modules then goes through about 40 development steps in a full development process. We have these development templates that are either like 20 or 40 steps long. So you have critical things like, here's your conceptual design, your diagrams, bills of materials, instructionals, CAD, CAM files, uh, videos, data collection, all of that that you need in order to, to document something. And if you can follow this, then you can have a lot of people do this. And with the immersion program, which what we're trying to do is once we have our fellows around the different places in the US, we can do parallel development events where we collaborate on Google Docs. We say, say prototype a cordless drill or something like that. Uh, we can do that. We can, we can work in parallel on that using a common platform. Uh, but we have to understand that there's a basic structure of modularity and what are all the different steps that are required. So that's the kind of collaborative literacy that's required to do that. And the idea here is that um, it's about intrinsic motivation in people that, I mean, in our world, like, why do not more people work on exactly what they need in their life to, to be fully consistent with their mission or their life's purpose? That's a very big thing for us that we question a lot because um, more than 50% of the people in the world today, or like in the U.S., hate their jobs. So, you know, what are people doing? Um, you know, spending all that energy of their precious life doing something they don't necessarily like. I mean, we want to pursue other things, and humanity in general has not really gotten beyond that. A lot of people are pretty much trapped in their way of life and not really able to get beyond it, but we can create our, our own world and build ourselves, build our world like we need to uh, so that we can be really happy at the end of the day. And in this open source game, um, What's our competitive advantage, if you can call it that? Well, I think it's, it's about the ethical economy. That's kind of the differentiating thing. Uh, ethics are a very powerful thing, uh, if you can be doing things for the benefit of everybody and for the environment. So um, I think the economy in general is, is getting more conscious and ethical in general. Like, you can't get away with murder like maybe 200 years ago, like killing people or slavery or whatever. You know, things are moving up slowly. Take a few steps forward, maybe a step back, <laughs> a few steps forward, and so forth. But definitely uh, getting towards the open source ethical economy, we, we equate open source with ethical because we're saying if it's open source, everyone benefits. That's a very simple idea, but very hard to, for most people to do in practice. And more sin, can I throw yeah. in another uh, advantage? I would say it's empowerment. Yeah. You're talking experiential, so it's yeah. not just ethical, it's all of us having a, a greater sense of control of our lives, because we have the tools and the knowledge and, you know, not just the hardware and software, but also the infrastructure of our relationships with each other, because that's what we're changing. Yeah, no, that's a good point. It is absolutely about empowerment. I read Stephen Pinker's book called Enlightenment Now, and yeah. it's amazing how things <coughs> are going that direction under the current of consciousness, even people who want to believe those things haven't done the research to prove it to themselves because they didn't believe that things could be as good as they are in that respect. You know, not that it's a complete, but things are definitely moving in that direction.
direction, no. Yeah, uh, definitely they are. Are you saying that most people are not aware that they can actually have control over their destiny? Is that what you're well, saying? What I'm saying is I'm, I'm naturally uh, a you know, skeptical person about human nature, and I would like to be more optimistic, but I wouldn't have believed all the things you talked about in this book unless you documented them. I wouldn't even have the impetus to start looking because I wouldn't um. think that uh, any of the stuff that's happening is actually happening. Mm. But he makes a really good case for, you know, a uh, trend towards, you know, uh, morality and uh, collaborative behavior just because you know, it didn't show the, the trend line of the genie going up but kind of going down at the same time. Uh, technology leverages power into fewer hands, but there's a trickle-down effect that's inescapable. So everyone, you know, everyone's standard of living is uh, logarithmically progressing, even though it's, you know, much more quickly being concentrated at the top of the pyramid, yeah. but it's still rapidly progressing for everyone, regardless of the wishes of people who control resources. Yeah, things are getting better in general, but we can't say blank that it's getting better for everybody, because like, for example, the, you know, say the microbes in the soil that don't exist here, they don't have a word in it, you know, right. like there's, there's definitely gaps in it. I think we can all agree that it can be better. Like. Like, I, my question would be, okay, well, why are you satisfied with the trickle-down effect if it can be better, you know? Satisfied is, is not what I would say. Um, yeah. It, it can always be better, but it's right now better than the new normal effect. Right now is way better than a thousand years ago or 500 years ago. There, though, um, if you read, yeah, I mean, if you read some of this history, like, I read in, um, it was... Homo Sapiens by Yuval Harari. Yeah. Mm. In that book, um, I think there's some mention about, yeah, I mean, we don't really, I mean, of course, there's definitely, like, materially, we're way better off. But, I mean, some people still argue that in a hunter-gatherer society, we're not, um, I'm not sure if it was Homo Sapiens, another book I ran into, but there's there are some people that still claim right now that yeah I mean we we did not go into cities and a grand, grand concentration because that was the preferred choice it's like we were forced to because we would oh yeah so here's the argument we basically would steal everybody's resources and then we needed to wall up in a city so we wouldn't get killed to do that so it's short nutshell argument of why uh, like cities yeah like yeah. I think there's still debate on the city question whether, like, why did cities come about? And everyone's like, oh, well, obviously they're superior. You have work there. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. But that's not, I, don't, I, I, have, I would say that's far from the truth. There's, there's much more to that story. Like, to me, like, in a very basic sense, well, yeah, of course, if you, I mean, why did first cities start up? They, they started up so you can wall yourself up. Like, all the initial cities were, like, walled up so you don't get killed. Well, why did they have to do it in the first place? Because they, the name of the game was plunder, so you had to do that. But I don't know. Um, maybe we weren't enlightened at that time enough to not plunder, and maybe we're not even today. But I think it's always a trick. We always have to question. We don't. We shouldn't just say, "Oh, well, obviously cities are better." No, so I first craftsmanship and technology development are, you know, concentrated. But it's changing now because you can. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, there's a long debate on that. Right now, in, in today's world, you can certainly have a, a lot of prosperity with the Internet where you have data pumping into every location wherever you are. And you don't necessarily have the impetus to be in a city to be most creative. Right. You know, so I think that's changing. So, so the point is that many different options are available at any time, people tend to gravitate to the easiest one. Uh, I wouldn't say cities were like a major success of civilization. They were, they were a response to our suckage. <laughs> uh, I don't know, whatever. Um, yeah, but a lot of debate.
Uh, it's an interesting conversation, but we should ask these questions and read the history because uh, I think there's a lot of myths going around today about how things work in general. So, you know, generally, generally, that's true. Uh, okay, so just back to the conversation at hand here. So, you know, the latest on our developments is establishing some kind of a meaningful revenue model that we can sustain this work with. The normal that we do is typically charge people like $100 a day for tuition, which is applicable here. Uh, people get an immersion experience, you learn a lot of good stuff. We can also do a product sale, like if we build a brick press, we can sell that to a client. We typically invite the client to the workshop, so they actually know how to build it and maintain it. Uh, so that's, that's basically that. And, but I think the open source everything store, or let's say the whole, the open source earth catalog, or however you call this, um, collaborative product development, where just like Linux has done, it's created sphere products. So, so take any product at all that can be produced with open source microfactory, like a cordless drill, a camera, an aerial drone, another 3D printer, whatever, consumer goods, vacuum cleaners. Why isn't that all open source developed collaboratively instead of by thousands of companies that are all competing? I think we can totally now with the, the beginning of ac the access to the open source microfactory that kind of technology and all open source, I think we can get many, many people involved in that. So there could be micro factories in every single location. Like, you know, like today, maybe every city, little city or town has its corner gas station or corner store. Well, same thing should happen for, for the circular economy where we're building things in communities. And once again, the main advantage of that being, it's not really the price, but it's, it is the price if you consider a lifetime. Because if you get a cordless drill that you can maintain yourself and replace, you don't have to throw it out like we do here every couple of years. I mean, the drills, for example, cordless drills last a couple of years before they're destroyed. But if we can keep them alive forever, that's the real advantage. Lifetime, life cycle economy. We're taking those, those feedstocks, reusing them, grind the plastic down. Um, with induction furnace that's part of the set, then you know, melt down the metal too and roll your own steel, just like we do with the plastic. The same thing's going to happen for metal. And that's that's uh, we're going to be working on that probably in a couple of, couple of years with induction furnace. Next year is largely the bigger open source microfactory machines and big equipment. And then after that, it's tech recursion. That means we're starting to make parts. We're starting to make the actual metal on a small scale one more time. So we can do it. And the uh, revenue milestones so far that we've seen, when we did the CD Home workshop, we made 25K from tuition for five days of a workshop. It means 50 people signed up or so. Um, our goal is to, to create a product that we sell turnkey for about $70,000. There's a lot of different costs organizationally, logistics wise and all that. Um, but the cost in there is 30,000 in materials. So imagine getting a house like that at about one third the cost of industry standards. This is where OSC fellows come in next year. We're going to start that training in uh, September of 2019. And that's when we're going to develop the capacity to go to other places. Right now, people are, you know, everyone's asking us, can you build me a house? We say, sorry, we can't. Uh, we don't have the people. So we're training them. And that's, this would be a major, major thing. And uh, definitely, I mean, housing is something everybody understands. But people are very excited about the aquaponic greenhouses. And it's great. So revenue milestones on a CB press, we can do about $10,000 of net for a three-day workshop, which is about 5K in tuition and 5K product sale. We charge, say, 10,000 for the machine, and 5,000 of that is materials. So that's, that's kind of the basic thing. That could apply to many things, like the tractors or other things. For the 3D printer, it's a little different. It's a new, new picture button. If we have 12 people uh, sign up, uh, we're charging 300 bucks for the day workshop on top of the bill of materials cost. And that's a revenue model that works, that could definitely sustain an operation like that. And we're leveraging digital fabrication, the ability to really leverage the open source economy. Believe it or not, the most popular op uh, 3D printer in the world right now, the Prusa printer, is actually open source. But you can't really replicate it that well Right now, they're using a lot of their custom parts, so you can't just go, go to the Amazon or the corner store to get them. Um, our unique feature is we are 
scalable, modular, so you can use like different tool heads for, for CNC milling or laser cutting, anything else. The other part is the distributive aspect, the, the fact that it's common off-the-shelf parts. Anyone can do this. Further, we encourage people to replicate. In fact, we are training people to replicate, which uh, I don't know anybody else in the world that's doing that along those lines. And I think that's a, that's a great idea. As I think as we build momentum on this, we get more people involved. And just like Linux, show products that are simply better, uh, better environmentally, socially. Uh, I envision something like instead of going to Walmart, you would go to a place that's the Walmart replacement where it's production on demand and you can participate in that. So you can walk in there, it's a micro factory, you can either get the product finished or you can actually build it yourself there. So it'll be a place like this where you can have guided build experiences as a normal part of life. Why not? I think a lot of people are missing that aspect of being fundamentally productive with their hands or just feeling that sense of accomplishment that comes from material objects producing them, being involved in them. I think there's a big psychological gap that we are missing in that since we, you know, we evolved, we, we descended from the trees, uh, we're always building things. Right now we're kind of just gotten back to the computer, kind of doing, um, having much involvement with, uh, with nature or production. And that's why there's a lot of sick puppies out there from that. <laughs> there's a lot of psychological problems that come. I think a lot of psychology is from people questioning their meaning of their life. I, think, I do think a lot of that is related to, um, finally, what are you doing for a living? What's, what is your life? Where's it coming from? You know, are you doing something that's regenerative, that's really nurturing you, or are you being part of a system that's, that's potentially causing our destruction? Sir? What is the individual participation cost for the 3D printer workshop? Is it 36 divided by 12? Yeah, so it's eight, 12 times 300 in there. That's, here I'm talking about the net, not the bill materials, because okay. you pay 800 bucks if you include the materials, which are 500 for the printer as it stands right now. Okay. So in these figures, typically here I'm talking about the net revenue. Yeah. All right. The other thing we're working on too is uh, open source materials production facility. So once you get to open sourcing things, then you need to open source the materials with which you're going to build. So that's part of the Open Building Institute. So you can do things like building your your compressed earth blocks. We got limestone here. What's concrete? It's called burned limestone. That's, that's what they used to do and many, many kilns across the countryside in England before concrete plants came about. So, for example, here we can be making concrete. We can be smelting aluminum from clay if we have that technology. We can be definitely recycling steel as in melting it with an induction furnace. We can make bioplastics, lumber. Uh, glazing is refined sand. All this stuff can be done with, uh, if you have open source appropriate technology, you can fit that all in a, the material production facility that's like 4,000 square feet, probably the size of our workshop. Um, and just reconnecting back to the, to the natural resources all around. So instead of having like these big mega industrial complexes, things get more integrated with nature and more ecologically sane because if we close that loop, if you start caring about where your stuff comes from, if you bring it closer to you, you're going to care more about it. You're going to start saying, hey, you know, this comes from the earth and we're polluting the earth. We can't do that. If it's right in your backyard, it's much more transparent as opposed to we just outsource our problems to somewhere else, including then our garbage, which we send, like, say, e-waste or whatever, we just send it away out of sight. Um, so the local economy, the microfactory idea, allows you to also think more about it and uh, become more integrated with, with nature through technology, which is kind of counterintuitive, kind of you'd say, that uh, but, but you can't say to the true environmentalist that you, if you want to take care of nature, become a technologist. You know, learn more about technology. Because, I mean, that's absolutely true, I would say. So, uh, other things like hydrogen. I don't really expect, you know, people like Musk, for example, really beat on hydrogen. But right now, to separate water is not a big deal. 
separate water into oxygen and hydrogen. That's a DIY endeavor. To pressurize it, if you want to store it, is uh, you would need a $3,500 compressor. And if you have a propane tank, you can compress hydrogen. You, sp you split the water so you get just hydrogen, just oxygen, not the two together. That's, that's explosive. But I mean, things like hydrogen, I mean, uh, people are really poo-pooing it right now, but I don't see why that's not going to be the future, uh, personally. Um, so within the next few years, we are going to try to do the hydrogen thing here. Uh, because, for example, oxyhydrogen fuel, oxyhydrogen fuel torching. Uh, when you talk about oxyacetylene from cutting metal, initially they started with oxyhydrogen because they could generate hydrogen very easily. That used to be more popular for torch cutting than, than oxyacetylene. So if you look at, you study the history, you see that, hey, this has already been done. Uh, why are we compressing? I really don't understand that question because you certainly have, even if you want to drive a car, a regular gas engine burns hydrogen. Hydrogen is, is a burnable gas like gasoline. Why are we doing it? Compress, it, compress, it, compress tanks that go up to like five or even 10,000 pounds per square inch, kind of like the compressed air tanks that we have for like the welding gas or oxygen gas. Those stop, but th those are really heavy ones, they're steel, but they have composite ones that go to five or $10,000. I just don't get it why the hydrogen is not coming, but we'll, we'll work on it. 